Arundhati just said to me, uh, well, we can now talk about the things that I left out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what did you leave out? <laughs> you know, I, I was sitting there listening to you and thinking, There it was. There it is. Okay, let's go. <laughs> you don't want me to. You don't want me to say anything let's nice about. No. Okay. No. But really, uh, what uh, what I thought I was sitting there is uh, it was this mastery of detail, all expressed in the most poetic and beautiful way. That combination is so hard to achieve. I know this is not a lead-in to a conversation. <laughs> it's just, it's a final statement. <laughs> you see. But, uh, but I, uh, but let, let me ask you this, Arundhati. Uh, how did you come to decide, you know, r after writing The God of Small Things, that you were not going to immediately sit down and write another novel. Well, I actually, I would have had to decide to sit down and write another oh. novel. In that, I never, you know, I mean, I've never believed in this thing of having a single profession and sort of doing it, doing the same thing all your life. It feels like your brain is growing in one direction, you know, like some tumor. Mm. <laughs> I, I never, I, you know, a, lo a lot of people keep saying to me that you must be under a lot of pressure from your publishers to write another book. Well, I think that's, a, I mean, it's a bit dishonest to put it that way for me because no, no one can pressurize me, you know. I mean, they don't have a handle on me. It's only if, if I wanted to accept that pressure that it would be a pressure. And I... I, I just think that um, <clears throat> very soon, actually, very soon after I finished writing The God of Small Things and it came out, um, India did, you know, its nuclear tests and, and I, 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 re I recognized the fact that here was the, you know, the papers and lots of public people and writers and painters and everybody was standing up and applauding this horrible act. Mm -hmm. And I realized then that, you know, staying quiet was as political an act as speaking out. And I had the space to make a statement. And if I didn't, it was something that I couldn't live with, which was when I wrote The End of Imagination. And, and also, I think, um, being involved in the kinds of things I've been involved in in the last few years have been wonderful for me because I've met the most extraordinary people, I've been close to the most extraordinary political happenings and, and I also know that when I'm ready to write another book, if I'm ready to write, I keep saying the God of Small Things was a collaboration between me and a little bit of magic and mm. you have to know how to wait, you know. Mm. It'll come. <laughs> mm. it, if it doesn't, that's all right, mm. but if it does, it'll come. You can't you can't just, for, uh, you know, it's not some factory product. No, no one would accuse that of being a factory product. <laughs> no, I mean the next. No, the next. but uh, yeah. it was interesting what you said about, you know, that uh, turning to the political world you know, from writing a novel, you encountered people, you know, you uh, suddenly found all these, these people that you could work with and do things with. And uh, the writer who, working alone, writing a novel or a poem, you know, doesn't experience that. And the writers who never come out of, of their study, you know, or out of their agent's office, right, <laughs> the, uh, and, and get out into the struggle and turmoil of the world, they are missing something, you know, very, very important. I think, uh, I mean, the truth is that I was actually always a political person. Obviously, you know, it's not something that suddenly happens to you. So 
when I was studying architecture, uh, by the time I was in fourth year, I knew that I would never practice architecture, and I had become very interested in, in, in town planning and how cities came to be the way they were and how land use plans and architectural plans are designed to exclude most people and make them illegal and, you know, the whole business of the citizen and the non-citizen. So, uh, in a sense, The God of Small Things is also a very political book. And <clears throat> I think, I, I don't think I ever, I mean, obviously I was never the kind of person who was only in their agent's office because I didn't have an agent. I didn't even know there were such things until... You know, I wrote the God I'm of Small Things. I'm sorry to have uh, brought it no. up. <laughs> <laughs> But you're right. I think the, the business of getting into the world, you know, living mm. your life, living, and then writing about what you live is, mm. is what interests me, you know. And the idea that, I mean, I live in times, and I think those times are here in America now, but they've been in India for a while where <clears throat> when you write something, the worst thing that can happen to you is not a bad review. <laughs> you know, it's, it's somehow, it's, it's injected directly into, into life and you never know what's, what, what's going to happen if you write a book. And, I mean, the God of Small Things, I was of course taken to court for corrupting public morality. Yes. Which, yeah. which, which I had a technical problem with, because I said, at least he should have said, further corrupting public morality. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, <coughs> you know, when I, when I read about that charge against you, uh, <coughs> I immediately went back to the God of Small Things, because I wanted to see what pages there were, <laughs> you know, that were possibly corrupting public morality. And I found them. <laughs> and it was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but you, you, know, you said before you were always a political person. Well, I mean, not from the age of three or four or five, but you said something about, you know, when you were somehow finishing work at a school of architecture, you know, at some point you decided, no, this was not for you. So something must, I mean, did something happen? Well, uh, actually, you know, uh, absurdly, it It does start from the age of three or four, you know, because, <laughs> because I lived in a, you know, my, my mother came from this very little village in Kerala called Aymanum, and she, we, she belongs to a very parochial community called the Syrian Christians, and she married a Bengali, you know, outside the community, and then made the mistake of marrying him and then divorcing him, and came back to the village. And, you know, so, so we grew up sort of outside the realm of all the protections that that society chose to offer its members. And so from a very young age, one was aware of the fact that you were not going to be given those protections. Mm -hmm. And you, you had to constantly try to understand what was going on and how to survive in this space uh, and how not to to go under. And so my mother was very is very political in, in, not in this, you know, overt way, but I think the minute you lose the protection of this nuclear family that protects you from the world, you're on your own. And then politics is in your life. You have to ride the waves. You have to understand it. But you were on your own as a woman, which is a special situation. Yeah. Be, I mean, not just in India, I suppose, you know, being a woman on your own anywhere yeah. is uh, something to deal with, but I imagine that maybe in India there, there was something mm. It was, uh, about that. Yeah. It was, I mean, I, I, um, though my mother and I are great mates now, when I was 17, I, I left home and I was on my own. Um, being that woman, as the Supreme mm -hmm. Court mm -hmm. judges rightly yeah. call me. <clears throat> um, and I think, uh, you, you see what happens in India is that the, you know, the, the real life is so frightening that the middle class 
really protects itself and really turns inwards and it's almost blind. It, it's almost like they have some, some lenses that fall over their eyes and they can't see, they, they can't see the horrors around because that's the only way to survive in some sense. And, <clears throat> and I think when you fall out of that, that cozy little nest and there's no safety net, you realize that it's not all that horrible actually, <laughs> you know, and you, I, I don't think you can ever unlearn that once you've been there, however briefly or however temporarily, you, you don't forget, you know, you don't forget whatever happens to you. I keep thinking that there are people in the world who are safe and there are people in the world who are unsafe. And if you're unsafe, you always seek out the unsafe, you know, whatever happens to you in your life, you're always sort of taking that walk. So it was the best university, I think, to go to. <clears throat> it's interesting what you say about the, the, you know, the middle class of, of blinding itself, um, protecting itself from what is happening <clears throat> to so much of the population. And this is so much the history of the United States, you know, which you know, developed perhaps the largest middle class uh, uh, and uh, does the United States has had enough wealth so it could bribe enough people in the population to create a middle class which became useful as a buffer uh, between the very rich and the, that uh, part of the population uh, which could not even rise into the middle class uh, and, uh, and, and so the middle class uh, in the United States uh, has always been uh, sort of enticed by the establishment into thinking that it can rise into the upper class uh, and not told that it can also descend. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, uh, the result is the United States educational system that teaches us from the very beginning that we're sort of one, that we're not a class society. To use the term class in the United States, it's just a term you use for school, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is my class, you know, thing. I'm in and sixth yeah, <clears throat> but uh, the idea of a class society is uh, something that uh, has always made. Uh, people in power nervous, if anybody brings up the idea of c class, class conflict, class struggle, uh, yeah, you, mustn't, like you mustn't mm. talk mm. about that. And the, uh, uh, we're brought up in the United States to believe that we're one big happy family. You know, <laughs> and aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, we, it's... Uh, well, you know, we all have the same interest. You know, we have, in fact, we have the language to, mm -hmm. to uh, try to make that imprint on the American uh, people, you know, the language of national interest, the phrase mm -hmm. national oh, interest, yeah. as I'm assuming, familiar. yeah, we all have the same interest. Yeah. You know, Exxon and I have the same <laughs> interest. You know. Enron and I. <laughs> Enron and <laughs> you, <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, uh, and, you know, and, and, uh, and so it takes, uh, um, but, you know, there's a, there's a perception that people in the United States have growing up, especially people in the working classes of the United States, they know that their interests in Exxon are not the same. And they show yeah. it, yeah. you know. Well, the thing is, in India, it's, so it's so complicated that sometimes the more you, the longer you live there, the more confused you get, you know, because it's, uh, when, you, when you think of class, in India you have so many other things too, you know, you have caste, which is um, a complex business because, you know, I grew up in Kerala, where, which, is, which had the first ever democratically elected Marxist government in the world. Mm. But all the leaders of the Marxist 
party are Brahmins, you know. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a very complex way in which they, mm. they use all these things. to. Ma ma you know, the Indian democracies must be one of the most fascinating beasts on earth. And then you have such a complicated network of, of region and religion and language. So you have a situation where you have a country where we have, I think, I think it's 18 or 19 official languages, and then there are hundreds and hundreds of dialects. And you can't, uh, the, you know, the Supreme Court functions in English. Nobody can understand what's going on in there. I mean, even if you speak English, you mm. can't understand. Mm. But yeah. <coughs> yes. like, yeah. Imagine when they gave a judgment about me, they said, vicious stultification and vulgar debunking cannot be permitted to pollute the pure stream of justice. <laughs> yeah. well, that's so, what you were doing. And I, yes. <laughs> doing, but I had to really look up the dictionary to yes. figure out what they meant. Yes. And at the end of it, they just kept saying, but yeah. the respondent is not behaving like a reasonable man. Mm. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and at least I can follow what they're saying, but you know, mm. the people from the Narmada, yeah. they have no idea what is this court and mm. w how do you file a police case or if a, there's a police case filed against you, what does it say? What are you so, you know, it's just like living, it's like, I keep thinking, it's like if I were living in Czechoslovakia or something, how, how would I function? And that's the way most Indians have to function in India. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So it's. You know, we don't understand our Supreme Court either. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, you know, and the whole object of going to it's law school, meant to understand. you know, yeah. yeah, is to not allow people to understand what you're saying. In fact, that, yeah. that's one of the reasons that the court got very angry with me was because when they filed this case, I, I said I won't get a lawyer and I will write my own reply, which I did. Mm. It, and it was perfectly legal. I mean, you know, I checked it with a lawyer, but it was written in language that ordinary people could understand. It was published in the press, and that they didn't like. So every time I went to court, they got a rash. You know, it was like, why is she here? Mm. <laughs> Take her away. Yeah. That's something you're supposed to do, because you're taking a job away <laughs> from, <laughs> you know, from <laughs> People, you know, who are desperately unemployed yeah. and you know, they need work, uh, and so they don't—they don't, they don't like people to defend themselves. But it's interesting during during the Vietnam War, uh, we began to get used to people defending themselves in court because uh, uh, we had, you know, these anti-war protesters uh, were part of this new '60s generation. You know, forget the experts, forget the professionals. We don't have any faith in them. All these lawyers are over 30. <laughs> you know, we don't want, and we don't trust professionals. And we want to speak for ourselves. I mean, it was such a refreshing thing, actually, that they were breaking through this notion that somebody must speak for you. And, uh, and so in trial after trial that took place of anti-war protesters, uh, people represented themselves, mm. which uh, was, made judges very nervous, you know, made the, you know, the prosecution very nervous, yeah. uh, but uh, enabled, you know, the, the honest feelings of the defendants to come across, you know, to the court. But in, you know, in India, the, actually the whole thing about contempt of court, uh, it has a very sinister edge to it because, see, the Supreme Court is actually the most powerful institution in India. And as the government and the politicians get more and more corrupt, the Supreme Court has started making huge decisions on their behalf. Mm -hmm. So the Supreme Court decides whether a dam should be built or not, whether the slums should be cleared or not, whether industry should be in the city or outside, whether privatization should be you know, endorsed, whether structural adjustment is a good thing or not. All these decisions which affect the lives of millions of people are being taken now in the Supreme Court. And the Contempt of Court Act, law, says that while you can criticize a judgment, you cannot say, put a series of judgments together and say, what is the Supreme Court up, up to? What is the politics of the Supreme Court? If I, supposing I had 
evidence that a Supreme Court judge was corrupt. Supposing I had him on film taking a bribe. It's not admissible in court because you can't lower the dignity of the court by saying that a judge is corrupt. Yeah. <laughs> this, is the, this is the situation, you know. And so, you know, even when I went to prison for contempt of court and came out, we had a big uh, press conference. There were hundreds of journalists. A lot of senior editors spoke out quite bravely about this act because they are most scared of the court, more scared of the court than of politicians. And, you know, a normal journalist, it's not that you're going to have a death sentence if you do, if you commit contempt of court, but six months in prison, you're going to lose your job, you're going to have maybe two or three years of a criminal trial, you have to hire a lawyer, no one's willing to take the risk. So there's just dead silence on that subject, you know. It's very, very frightening. And, and that's what I said in my affidavit, a judicial dictatorship is as bad as any other kind of dictatorship. <laughs> um, yeah. now, we have a situation where uh, the, the Supreme Court does make decisions which are important, uh, but not usually on the most important things. And by that I mean on issues of war and peace. Mm. That is, uh, when it comes to issues of war and peace, the Supreme Court may just as well not exist. Yeah, well, they true. defer, they mm -hmm. defer to the power of the president, just as Congress defers to the power of the president. And there's no democracy in foreign policy. I mean, you, you brought up the issue, and you said democracy in India is very complicated. Well, democracy in the United States <laughs> is very complicated uh, because uh, we have democracy and we don't have democracy. It's here and it's not and here. It's gone. <laughs> yeah, and you have, you know, you have democracy, you know, once in four years, for a moment. <laughs> yeah. And even there, you don't have democracy. Yeah. You see, you know, but you have, you know, you and yeah, you are supposed to have political democracy with elected representatives and so on. You know, you know, but you certainly don't have economic democracy. You don't have democracy in the workplace. You don't, don't have democracy in everyday life. And so, you know, you, there's a pretense that you have democracy in political life, but in all you the... You have every, elections. Yes, yes. Elections are democracy. Yeah, ele no, elections. <laughs> I mean, imagine just, you know, the, you go into the voting booth and you pull the chain. Well, you, <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, and you have fulfilled your duty, you know, and, uh, and that's it. And then you can sit back and let the president do what he wants. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, during the Vietnam War, the, uh, you know, there are Americans who are naive enough to, th to believe the Constitution of the United States or to believe what they learned in, in uh, junior high school about American democracy and they learned that we have three branches of they, everybody learns the same thing you know you, you must have some very things that everybody learns right and here we learn we have three branches of government the teacher always makes a diagram on the board which is you know, very because you know you can't imagine it in your head you see and so you know that you can keep two things but not three things in your head. <laughs> and so you have three branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. And what you learn is that there are checks and balances. And that each branch is there to check the other. And when you sit there as a young person, you say, this is marvelous. <laughs> Nothing bad can happen. <laughs> you see? And then you grow up. <laughs> And you see nothing but bad things happen. <laughs> and you see, and this is what, and during the Vietnam War, you see, the president decides on war. Or I should say the president and the people around him. Some of them are known to the public, others are not known to the public. And, and uh, but the president and the people around him decide on war. He goes to Congress. I mean, it's, to me, it's absurd that 
liberal people today, the, the, the most courage that some congressman can muster up against the war in Iraq is to say, let Congress vote on it. <laughs> to say, it's as if we don't know the history of congressional obsequiousness. You know, we, if we don't know the history of Congress approving every war that has ever been fought in one way you know, or another. Uh, so uh, what happened in, during the Vietnam War is that a number of GIs, and this is you know, one of the glorious things about the G Vietnam War was uh, the uprising of soldiers yeah. against the war and the organization of so Vietnam veterans against the war. Uh, you know, wonderful, uh, wonderful dramatic scenes of that kind of resistance. And there were these GIs who refused to go to Vietnam and they said, the Constitution says Congress must declare war. Congress has not declared war. And they had learned in junior high school that the job of the Supreme Court is to see to it that things are constitutional. Mm -hmm. So they appealed to the Supreme Court. And what did the Supreme Court do? It said, uh, we can't handle this. <laughs> it's funny, you think, the Supreme Court, they have black robes. They, you know, you think they have power. And, and they shrink into the distance as soon as war appears. And so what is left then to the people which happened during the Vietnam War. And I think what you, you're talking about in India, it's left to the people of India. I, when I saw that film, wonderful, the wonderful film was made about Arundhati's uh, little tiff with the Supreme Court. <laughs> I didn't know how to describe it. <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to say a war with the Supreme Court. A flotation. But <laughs> a little encounter with, but there's a wonderful film made about it. Uh, which you should see. And it was, it was great to see the, those huge crowds of people supporting you, uh, you know, during that. But, and, and I'm sure it was because of those huge crowds that the Supreme Court, you know, uh, went easy on you, yeah. sen didn't sentence you to life imprisonment. <laughs> right. No, life was not on the cards, <laughs> yeah. fortunately. Yeah. Mm. But I like what you said about the. Uh, uh, that in India there is a, a kind of uh, inherent anarchism which will save India we one hope, day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's like trying to corporatize India, it's like trying to put an iron grid on the ocean. Mm, I, yeah. <laughs> I just think even the fascists are not disciplined there, so <laughs> <laughs> hopefully they'll mess it up. Mm. <laughs> yeah. mm. Well. Uh, I think they, we can count on them to mess it up. Yeah, I uh, hope so. You know, we, uh, we need that. <laughs> I mean, we, because it, we'll try our best, you know, and we'll accomplish a lot, but we do uh, really need them to mess it up. Absolutely. But I think we can count on it, because yeah. they do they, it. They do yeah. it. The trouble, the only trouble, Howard, is that in India right, right now, I think few Americans know about this, but in March this year, the, you see the, the BJP, which is the Bharatiya Janata Party, is, is part of what is, they call the Sangh Parivar, which is the whole sort of family of Hindu right-wing organizations. The BJP is the political end of it, and the, what's called the RSS, which is the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, is the cultural guild. Now the Prime Minister, the Home Minister, the Disinvestment Minister, all these people belong to the RSS. The RSS is, has been preparing the ground for this kind of right-wing, you know, India is only for the Hindus thing for, you know, since the late 20s. And they are openly, open admirers of Hitler and his methods and so on. And in March this year, there was a massacre of Muslims in Gujarat. And as soon as the massacre was over, the Gujarat government, uh, headed by the BJP, wanted to hold elections because they felt that they would win the elections because they had polarized the vote. And all over India, you know, they have what are called shakhas, which are branches where young people, 10-year-old uh, children are being indoctrinated into religious bigotry and hatred and how to uh, you know, create communal trouble and how to 
um, rewrite history books, and all this is happening. So the fascists will definitely mess it up. In fact, the reason they are so desperate is because in state after state, they were losing the elections. But you see now, whether they are in power or not, they've injected this poison into the veins of a very complex country. And that's very frightening, very, very frightening to have to deal with on a daily basis because you, you cannot imagine the things that happened in Gujarat. You know, little children, were, 2,000 people were killed. Women were raped. Women had their stomachs slit open and their fetuses pulled out. Not one or two, but many, many. Little children were forced to drink petrol and then matches were put down their throats. They just blew up like bombs, you know. So it's a very, very frightening situation just now. And this government in India keeps saying that we're natural allies of the US. So there hasn't, I mean, it's not just a coincidence that this was not reported or that it's being suppressed, you know. The whole nuclear mm, flashpoint with Pakistan was mostly due to the fact that the Indian government wanted to distract attention from the world's attention from Gujarat to this, and, and it was very, very successful in doing that. Well, if I hadn't read what you wrote about Gujarat and what happened there, I would never have known, because people in the United States uh, do not know what's happening in India. Yeah. In fact, people in the United States generally know very little about what is happening in the rest of the world. Thanks to the free press. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. You know. And, uh, and uh, it's clear that what we need more and more you know, is this you know, interchange across boundaries yeah. and the, the, the... Real globalization. Yeah, <laughs> people's globalization. You know, you talk about that. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, because I sort of feel like, you know, I see, I, I see the world with sort of chalk lines dividing everybody, and I see us as having the job of little by little walking across and those rubbing them and out. rubbing yeah. those chalk lines out. That's why I, keep, out, that's why I keep saying that I think literature is the opposite of a nuclear bomb. You know, yeah. when, when I wrote The God of Small Things, I would go to Estonia and Finland and hear from China and people say, oh, but this was my childhood. One mm. of the reasons why I never wanted it to be made into a film was because I thought there are six or seven million films going on in people's heads and this one filmmaker will come and take it away, you know. Let it be the world's yes. childhood. Yes. And yes. You know, the, the, the idea that, that the there is that, you know, that there is the human beings across the world do share love and terror and gentleness and these things which, which, which literature links up and which nuclear bombs just build the walls and separate. Um, I think your coming here does that. <laughs> Not only your writing does that, but you, your, your coming here and us listening to you and knowing that you know we are part of a caress. I don't know if any of you read Kurt Vonnegut's Cat's Cradle. You know Kurt Vonnegut is is this remarkable. You know, yeah, know. this this remarkable, interesting, odd <laughs> mind. You say, and in Cat's Cradle he talks of a caress. It's a caress when people feel an affinity with one another. They don't know exactly. Why? But it's a, it crosses all lines. It crosses national, racial, sexual, it crosses yeah. all lines. But it's, that's what we depend on. Yeah. It's, it's like I, I've never been to Pakistan. You know, Delhi and Pakistan, I mean Lahore are maybe a one-hour flight away from each other. I went to Pakistan last month. I had to go from Delhi to Dubai to Islamabad to Lahore. It took me 18 hours. And, um, you know, there's so much in the Indian press and equally in the Pakistan press about anti-India demonstrations and anti-Pakistan demonstrations and we're all going to kill each other and everybody hates everybody and so on. I, I landed in Lahore and within, you know, seconds we were all sitting at this dining table and I felt like I was in Delhi. We were, it was, it was just mm. so sad and, and the audience that came People were just, 
in tears, because, not because of me or what I said mm. or anything, just because it's such a relief not to always be subjected to this media's mm. representation mm. of government positions, mm. you know. And I, I really feel that the media, the, the corporate media has played a terrible part in all this. And people are just going to have to blow holes in, mm. in, this, in this dam between mm. them and, mm. and uh, you know, insist on l listening to, to independent real voices, real human beings. No. Yes. Uh, we were saying to one another, when you were not listening, uh, it's very hard to end a conversation on stage. <laughs> uh, and so the thought was that we would finish by Andati reading something that you would like to read to all of us. Okay. I'm, I'm, I, it'll just be two minutes. And um, it's just, it's, I just want to leave you with a, with a thought, with a way of seeing. Uh, this is part of um, the essay that I wrote when India tested nuclear weapons in 1998. <coughs> Uh, it's quite a long essay, so this is just a very small extract, a very pers the very personal part of it. Uh, in early May 1998, I left home for three weeks. While I was away, I met a friend of mine whom I've always loved for, among other things, her ability to combine deep affection with a frankness bordering on savagery. I've been thinking about you, she said, about the God of small things, what's in it, what's over it, under it, around it, above it. She fell silent for a while. I was uneasy and not at all sure that I wanted to hear the rest of what she had to say. She, however, was sure that she was going to say it. In this last year, less than a year actually, you've had too much of everything, fame, money, prizes, adulation, criticism, condemnation, ridicule, love, hate, anger, envy, generosity, everything. In some ways, it's a perfect story, perfectly baroque in its excess. The trouble is that it has, or can have, only one perfect ending. Her eyes were on me, bright with a slanting, probing brilliance. She knew that I knew what she was going to say. She was insane. She was going to say that nothing that happened to me in the future could ever match the buzz of this, that the whole of the rest of my life was going to be vaguely dissatisfying. And therefore, the only perfect ending to the story would be death. <laughs> my death. You've lived too long in New York, I told her. There are other worlds, other kinds of dreams, dreams in which failure is feasible, honorable, sometimes even worth striving for. Worlds in which recognition is not the only barometer of brilliance or human worth. There are plenty of warriors that I know and love, people far more valuable than myself, who go to war each day, knowing in advance that they will fail. True, they're less successful in the most vulgar sense of the world, word, but by no means less fulfilled. The only dream worth having, I told her, is to dream that you will live while you're alive and die only when you're dead, which means exactly what she said, looking a little annoyed. <laughs> I tried to explain but didn't do a very good job of it because sometimes I need to write to think. So I wrote it down for her on a paper napkin and this is what I wrote. To love, to be loved, to never forget your own insignificance, to never get used to the unspeakable violence and the vulgar disparity of life around you, to seek joy in the saddest places, to pursue beauty to its lair, to never simplify what is complicated or complicate what is simple, to respect strength, never power, above all, to watch, to try and understand, to never look away and never 
never to forget. Thank you.